This is Audio Immunity, a podcast about our body's never-ending fight with the outside world. Hi everyone, this is Audio Immunity, recorded on December 13th, 2017. I'm Kevin Bonham and joined as usual by Matt Woodruff. Hey everybody. Good evening, Matt. How are you? Uh, a little stressed out, uh, a little overextended at the moment, uh, probably, uh, which has <laughs> resulted in uh, me reading the wrong paper for this discussion, as it turns out. Uh, so Not only gonna... reading the wrong paper, but also <laughs> convincing me that I should read the wrong paper. Well, technically, yeah. it's debatable as to who read the wrong paper. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> Kevin's fault. I was trying to cover for him there. So Kevin yeah. is the reason that I have not read this paper yet. However, uh, Guilty. it is fortunate that this paper is on something that's pretty close to a paper that I submitted to immunity literally <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> All right. So I, I feel like Fortuitous. I might be able to talk about it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and that other voice you hear uh, is Chadine Tremeglio. That's right. Tremaglio. Wait, yes, no. Yes, oh, Tremaglio. It is <laughs> Tremaglio. Tremaglio, like mag light. A. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought I. Yeah, oh well. Whatever. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm just going to say Che Dean from now That's on and fine. make you introduce yourself. That's totally um, fine. <laughs> and how are you doing this evening? I'm well. I am. Was that a baby screaming in the back of your? Oh God! Can you hear them? <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, <laughs> it might be mine. I don't know. Yes, they're they're very very excited about the holidays. The ramp up has been I bet. a long time coming. So mm. <laughs> December is just in general kind of chaos around here. And uh, what are we all drinking this evening, Matt? Yeah, uh, I, you're, I got, you're stressed out. You should be drinking something real good. I got nothing. Nope, I got <laughs> nothing. Uh, all the windows in my house are being replaced tomorrow, and my house isn't very big. And, and you dumped your beer the, out the windows? No, all of my <laughs> all of my furniture needs to be pulled from the walls. And you've been to my house. There's a lot of furniture around the walls where the windows are being installed. And so there's at, definitely more furniture there now than there was the first time I visited. That is true. It's it's a little more populated than it was, and. Uh, uh, so some of that furniture is extraordinarily heavy and I'm moving it myself. So I decided that it would be best not to be drunk after we record this. That's fair. fair. That's very fair. fair. Chadine, what are you drinking this evening? Do you finally finally have a uh, alcoholic beverage? I do. As to a matter of fact, I, I am. I should have stuck with tea because I have yet another cold. One of the other joys of parenthood is just constant colds. Constant. Um, however, maybe someday we'll have a vaccine for that rhinovirus that you have. <laughs> Whoa, what a lead in, Kevin. <laughs> uh, yes, I am drinking the champagne of beers. I have a Miller High Life tonight, which I like is it. great. Yes, it's a favorite like of mine. <laughs> Don't even know what to say. Um, I, <laughs> You're such a beer um, snob. <laughs> I, I am a snob of, of many things, um, beer among them. Although, you know, I try really hard to have an open mind and drink a lot of different beers. I don't just stick with IPAs. You know, I try sour beers. Ooh, I try sours. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Not a I, fan. And <laughs> you know what's weird in Atlanta? In, what's a, that? in Atlanta, they really like sour beers. And um, in Boston, they had started to like sour beers. But if you walked into a bar and you look at their tap list, sour beers are really clearly designated, right, on the mm -hmm. tap list. There's always like a descriptor that it's a sour beer. That is not the case in Atlanta. If mm -hmm. you come to Atlanta and you're just ordering off a random rotating tap list, there's a good chance that it's going to be a sour beer and you're not going to know it until you drink it. Well, that's a nasty surprise. <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, or sometimes a wonderful surprise. Right, sometimes it can <laughs> be like, oh, that's that's interesting. I would definitely not have ordered that, but that's actually fine. And other times you're thinking, I wish that I had gotten some beer when I ordered this beer that I ordered. Mm. That's how well, I feel about uh, sour this beers. evening. I am not drinking an IP or a sour beer, I am drinking a uh, milk stout from Left Hand Brewing Company. What is a milk stout? It's a stout that is malty and has a little, it's a little sweeter. It's got a little bit of like lactose or something. I'm not entirely Whoa. sure to be perfectly honest, but it is delicious. This was the first stout that I ever had that I liked. It was like my gateway stout. Um, <laughs> Your gateway <and> stout. <laughs> It's amazing. And on a on a cold winter night, I it's like 20 degrees outside and I biked home 40 minutes. Um, and so, you know, maybe I should have a cider, a hot cider. But instead, I'm having milk stout and I think it's uh, pretty wonderful. Nice. I feel like that's appropriate. I think <sighs> I think left hand would not have it any other way. That's a pretty good 
pretty good way to use their product, I think. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. Yeah. Um, And it's just it's amazing. It's delicious. Um, But I probably should have saved my my attempt at a segue until we were actually going to discuss the paper. Um, And (laughs) since since Chadine is the only one that actually read it, um, she's going to actually do the introduction. So uh, why don't you do the honors? Sure. Why not? So today we are reading a paper. This one's actually from it was it looks like it was published last September, September of 2016. Uh, it's a nature communications article. And the title is a polyvalent and activated rhinovirus vaccine is broadly immunogenic in rhesus macaques. Very exciting. Well, the two first authors in this case are Sujin Lee and Min Trang Nguyen. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. I think it's um, Nguyen, but Nguyen, I have no idea. Okay. And uh, Martin L. Moore is the anchor author on this one. And they were from the Department of Pediatrics at Emory University. Uh, although my understanding, and you know, Matt, you're at Emory, so maybe you know better, is that Martin is now at a startup company. Is that true? My, yeah. So as I was uh, rapidly scanning through this paper and realizing that this was out of literally the department that somebody has tried to pay me from for the last three years, <laughs> I've not met any of these folks. Really? Okay. Yeah. And this is highly relevant, like I said, to some of the work that I was doing. And I am sort of astonished that I don't know more about any of these authors. So I apologize for being a hermit and a terrible colleague at Emory. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're giving them a, a review now, and so, you know, you can uh, go find them in the halls and tell them to listen to Audio Immunity. Yeah. Yep. That'll happen. It's likely. <laughs> Well, I will say that I knew of Martin Moore only because he's also a respiratory syncytial virus researcher. Um, and that was the field I came from prior to my postdoc. So that's what I did my grad work on was RSV. So I have read his papers. Um, one of the things I wanted to say about this paper, even before we began, was that I thought it was absolutely beautifully written. It was very clear and concise, which many papers from his lab tend to be. So I liked it for that reason. I also liked it because I would love it if we had a vaccine for the common cold. I am yeah, the no biggest baby when I get a cold. I feel like I I handle worse illnesses like strep throat or even the norovirus with much more dignity and grace than I do a cold. (laughs) I think everybody's a baby when it comes to cold viruses. They're the worst. Uh, But I I wanted to circle back and say that I think that like really nicely written papers that have really good English and are clear and flow nicely. That's a sort of underappreciated quality that papers can have. I feel like a lot of papers, people are just rushing to get them out. They pack them with as much stuff as they can because they just want to get published. But really clearly written papers are really wonderful. I agree. I'd like to even throw in an additional variable on that. Really clearly written papers with very simple, straightforward uh, figures in them that ask a very defined question, answer that question, and then wrap it up. I've come to really love that format. Like yes. if you can if you can explain a piece of new scientific knowledge to me in like three or four figures with the minimum amount of data you need in order to prove that, I feel like if I was a reviewer, I would just be like, please just print this. This is fine. You know Agreed. what I mean? Agreed. Yep. I think that the the ordered mind that it takes to write really well and concisely and clearly probably also is like well correlated with the ability to tell a story simply with a simple amount of data. That could be. But probably not like direct correspondence, but highly <laughs> correlated, I suspect. <laughs> Well, I think this paper lives up to that for sure. I, I thought it was a joy to read. I really enjoyed it. Um, also because it was much more... Matt, you and I should probably read it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've read all of the figures by now. So okay. all those figures are good. They were clear enough that you guys are probably... You have it down at this point. You can discuss it. It was not a tough paper to get through. Again, another reason why I liked it. No, pretty um, easy. So basically, the idea in this paper, um, and they spell it out beautifully in the abstract, they literally say, here, we test the hypothesis. I mean, they couldn't make it clearer. Uh, that um, if they increase virus input titers in these polyvalent vaccines, they might get broadly neutralizing antibody responses. So the history on a vaccine for the human rhinoviruses uh, is not good, basically because we have something like between 150 and 170 different serotypes of these viruses floating around. So that's very, very hard to protect against that many distinct uh, serological types of virus. Um, But they did show that there was some positive results back in the 70s with, um, I think, monovalent vaccines where they could get a good protective response to a single valency, you know, for, for for a 
for a cold virus. Um, can we just can we just back up and yeah. and talk about the cold? Because yeah, oh sure. You know, we want to say like I I always think about the cold as being caused by rhinovirus. Are there other viruses that actually contribute to the common cold, yes. or is it really just the norovirus strains? No, no, or the, not norovirus, uh, <laughs> rhinovirus strains. That's a whole other beast. Yeah. <laughs> No, there are actually quite a few. Um, so uh, human rhinoviruses probably make up one of the larger contingents of uh, common cold causing viruses. But there's also, um, you know, respiratory syncytial virus. The pneumoviruses cause cold like viruses uh, and, of course, the adenoviruses as well. So uh, they are just one group, but they happen to be a group that makes up such a large uh, population serologically. Like I said, 150 to 170 different serotypes of these viruses. So that's that's so quite a I, bit. So I don't understand why we can't just give people 170 vaccines. That's I mean, there's a great question. That's a lot of shots all at once, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not saying all at once. Just go back. Just keep going back. Just, you know, for years and years and years, we'll just keep giving people. adding them to the pile. Yeah, it's well, going to be so great. Basically, that's sort of Martin L. Moore's whole um, idea here is that he thinks that you can boil down a, a human rhinovirus vaccine just down to the mechanics of producing the vaccine itself. He thinks that that's kind of the main crux of the issue, that if you can get uh, a high enough titer of input virus for each strain in these virus polyvalent virus cocktails that he's making, then you can induce a broadly neutralizing antibody response against a big chunk of these viruses. So just to back up for a second um, and clarify some terms, you know, we're throwing around the term polyvalent, for example. Uh, in the case of this paper, what polyvalent vaccine means is that they combined several serological strains of uh, the cold virus into one cocktail vaccine and then immunized their animals with that. And when we say serological strains, uh, so viruses um, sort of exist in these spectrums of mutations, particularly these RNA viruses that we're talking about. So human rhinoviruses are single strand positive sense RNA viruses. Uh, and when we say 150 to 170 different serological types, uh, what we mean is there are 150 to 170 viruses that are just slightly different enough from each other that they're going to have a, a different collection of antigens presented when they infect you. So now, that is a challenge know, for the immune system. Yeah. Do you know uh, what the what the homology actually is between your average serotype? So, I, you know what? I'm not entirely sure. I know. So they break down in more broadly into three different species, for example, um, mm. A, B and C. And some of the latest stuff I saw about C, which is the most recent species they've discovered of the human rhinoviruses, is that um, the large, so this would require a little explanation about how the genome replicates, but basically it's a positive sense RNA genome. It is first uh, translated into a large polypeptide of that entire genome, and then that is cleaved up into multiple different proteins. That large polypeptide can differ, I think I, or I read something, is almost up to 50% uh, okay. homology wow. amino acid wise between species at least between c to a and c to b for example got it i don't and know so, what it is on the on the actual serological difference level right and so when they're talking about these polyvalent vaccines are they talking from all three species not they're sort in of this paper, picking no. across no okay. not in this paper that's one of the weaknesses of this paper unfortunately um a represents the largest uh, group of these viruses. So I think there's something like 83 different A types of these viruses. And A is the type they focus on in this paper. They sort of ignore B species. And I think it's something like 32 uh, of these are, are B. Uh, okay. C is new. So that I think uh, not new evolutionarily. So um, dating suggests it's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, but was sort of recently discovered, I think, in 2006 or 2007. Uh, there's about 55 species uh, of serological types of the C species. So that's not an insignificant number of viruses. But unfortunately, uh, it's different enough that it's not amenable to growing in typical tissue culture conditions that we know of right now. It's very hard to grow and get good oh, titers of the virus. It is. And it's going to be a huge roadblock, I think, to any progress on a rhinovirus vaccine going forward. So I just want to make make one clarification, too. So only because this is something I've taught a virology course in the past and this is 
often very confusing to students that the way that serotype is defined is um, it's basically entirely empirical. It's basically like if you vaccinate a mouse or a monkey or a person with one serotype, do the antibodies that get formed protect against another serotype? Right. So in some cases, you can have viruses that where like, you know, you could engineer a virus where everything about the virus was 100 percent identical, except for like a spike protein that differed by a little bit. And if it's the right amino acid that's different, you're going to need an entirely different antibody in order to bind exactly. to it. Exactly. That's a little bit simplified, but it, it can be confusing because sometimes viruses that are sort of like distant on an evolutionary tree are actually the same serotype, but ones that are close together can be different serotypes. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. Not that it's necessarily relevant, but um, no, it's a it good point to make. Think. It's a very well, good think, point to make. Yeah, I think it is relevant um, and we'll get into it a little bit. But, you know, part of the part of the story that we just submitted recently basically suggests that there can be uh, competitive events that occur in simultaneous vaccination. Um, but, you know, exactly how related the two antigens are plays a large role as to whether that competition actually comes into play or not. So knowing sort of exactly where these serotypes differ, I think, could actually help a lot in the interpretation. Mm. So does that play in at all to the idea of like original antigenic sin? Um, it does not, although it's, different. it's worth pointing out in this paper. And again, I'm I've got sort of fresh eyes on this paper. It's worth pointing out that original antigenic sin uh, is a real thing in people. Um, it's not clear to me. So these are rhesus macaques. Yeah. Well, mice for the most part. And then at the end, rhesus macaques. Yep. Yeah. So Can we just define original antigenic sin because I yeah. don't think that's necessarily yeah, a household. No, you're term. right. Sure. That is that is. So original antigenic sin is this idea that came about in the I think it was the 60s and 70s. It definitely wasn't later than the 70s, but um, the idea is that when your adaptive system gets active, especially your B cell repertoire, you have this long lived memory that sort of stays with the organism for much longer than the disease does. Right. So you get your uh, MMR vaccine, for example, and you have decades worth of antibodies against measles, mumps and rubella from that vaccine. So uh, because that antibody already exists um, that antibody is being, sorry, that antibody comes from somewhere, right? That antibody is coming from memory cells that are left over from the initial response. In the case of the antibody production, you're talking about memory B cells that stay with the organism uh, for potentially as long as the life of the organism uh, in some sort of extreme cases. So uh, the idea here behind original antigenic sin is that if you get vaccinated with something that you already have B cells that kind of see it. So imagine you got infected with flu virus right when you were seven and you developed a really strong B cell plasma cell response against it. Right. If you get a different strain of flu later on in life some of those B cells might be what we call cross reactive. They might not be specific for the new strain that is coming in, but they might be just specific enough where their B cell receptors sort of see it and they get tickled a little bit. And so the idea of original antigenic sin is that your memory responses from, from previous infections might actually interfere with your new adaptive immune system's ability to recognize this new strain. Because one thing that we do know is that a memory B cell, even if it's relatively low affinity, is going to have a much easier time becoming activated than a new naive B cell. So if the choice is, you know, am I going to activate the memory or am I going to activate this new arm of the adaptive system that now recognizes the new virus, uh, chances are your immune system is going to skew towards activating something that was already there to begin with, which means you might not wind up with as good an adaptive response or as specific an adaptive response as you would have otherwise. Because the notion is that if you started with a naive cell or all of the pool of naive cells, you might have one that through somatic hypermutation might get you to a higher affinity than starting from the place that your memory B cell is at. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You might have a different, a totally different B cell repertoire that gets involved in a totally naive response versus sort of your memory response, which was stimulated before, which is already sort of skewed in the direction where it was previously effective, but 
not necessarily presently effective. Right. Yes. Because so, viruses experience a lot of antigenic drift, or at least some do. Yeah. Yeah, they they sure do. And you know that a lot better than I do. And the reason that I bring it up here, and I think that the idea of original antigenic sin is important, is because especially if you're doing these vaccines in mice, right, these mice are housed in specific pathogen-free facilities. So they're not going to have any kind of memory B cell response. Whereas in a human, let's say you've had five or 10 different rhinoviruses over the course of your young life. If you try to give this vaccine um, to a person that already has a memory B cell response against uh, other versions, other serotypes of the virus, uh, it may change the way that you could uh, see these responses. That's a very good point. Um, but to answer your original question, uh, no, <laughs> what I'm talking about is actually not original antigenic sin. There's an okay. additional layer of competition where there, uh, when you're undergoing simultaneous vaccination B cell responses, regardless of your previous experience, if the antigens are close enough to each other, you will get a level of competition that can sometimes interfere with the uh, the eventual response. Oh, okay. Well, that is a good point, actually, that I think we should probably come back to at the end of this paper when we're trying to decide whether or not we think this is going to go well when they bring this study into humans. Um, so uh, basically where they started in this paper, if you're looking at figure one, um, they, they do all of the initial studies in this paper in mice. Uh, that's because there are really no good animal challenge models for human rhinovirus. Um, but you can recapitulate aspects of the pathogenesis in animals like mice and cotton rats. So they went with mice to start with. Uh, and in the first figure, they're they're basically testing the immunogenicity, immunogenicity of 10 valent uh, human rhinovirus vaccines. So the idea here is they mix up these cocktails of, of essentially 10 different serotypes of the virus. And specifically, uh, they actually do. So they do have a monovalent. They have a trivalent. They have a, a pentavalent. Busted out the penta there. Whatever seven would be. Is that septa? Septavalent. <laughs> septavalent. <Yes>. Nice. <laughs> nice. No, I, I'm pretty sure it's heptavalent, <laughs> hepta, actually. Hepta. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, okay. it probably well, is. He's probably pro right. Yeah. Whatever. And a tenvalent. Deca. Deca Deca valent. Valent. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> To get yeah. all fancy. Uh, so they test, basically, they're testing out whether or not increasing the valency of their vaccine preps uh, has any effect on the titers of neutralizing antibodies that they get back. So they're immunizing the mice uh, and they test first the naive uh, immune serum in these mice to make sure that they don't already have a neutralizing antibody response. Um, so as you were saying, Matt, you know, it's an issue if you've already had a response to one of these viruses, for example, you might not get a good response to the vaccine later, you know, if you've had a, if you've already had an initial infection or even another vaccine. Yeah. Of course, or, these mice are naive. maybe it would work gangbusters and your memory would boost everything <laughs> that you've already got. And I can tell you that companies have gone in that direction, too. So, oh, they have. you know, yeah. I, so this is the reason why you use something like uh, pertussis toxin as your sort of base protein oh. in vaccines. The idea that companies have come up with is that. Uh, because you've been previously vaccinated with pertussis, well, if most you of us have. most of us get vaccinated against pertussis, um, so most of us have been vaccinated against pertussis, and we get a really strong anti-pertussis response, and that's both a B cell and a T cell response, right? And your T mm -hmm. cell response is going to dictate your future B cell responses to pertussis. That makes sense so far. Yes. Um, so if you've got a new antigen that you want to vaccinate somebody against, why not take advantage of that pre-expanded memory T cell pool that you've already created against pertussis, right? That's clever. So what you can do is you can take your protein that you want to vaccinate with, you can stick it right on to pertussis toxin, and the idea is that you'll get new B cells that bind uh, your protein of interest. And when those B cells grab it, they internalize it, and then they present the pertussis peptides, right? And your expanded memory T cell pool will drive whatever B cell response in an idyllic world where everybody gets vaccinated against everything effectively. Um, Very well, but clever. There's, we're doing all kinds of tangents, but I think it's interesting. Yeah. So the the that strategy has to like it's going to come up against a wall, right? Like if you try to do everything with anti with pertussis, eventually it's just going to be the same B cells over and over again that are getting stimulated against 
<laughs> random crap, right? So, well, is- so what you're <laughs> suggesting is that maybe there is a problem consistently using the same protein over and over again because original antigenic sin is going to eventually wipe out your ability to respond to anything attached to pertussis, right? Yeah, it's not it's not exactly the same as original antigenic sin. It's more that like if if I've got a, a limited pool of T cells, yeah, presumably some of the B cells that were originally generated against pertussis toxin are still hanging around. Right. And if they just keep getting boosted, they're going to be at super high, uh, high levels in all of your lymph nodes. Yeah. And like they're going to be the ones that get triggered first. Like even if there is a B cell around that can grab onto, you know, whatever your your flu HA uh, pertussis conjugate, all of the anti pertussis B cells are going to be much more um, amenable to getting activated. Yeah. Um, so I maybe it is kind of antigenic sin, but it, it kind know. of is. Um, so I'm you'd be surprised at how little of. So what you said, first of all, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, you'd be surprised at how poorly defined those kinds of systems are. So I, I would not I, be surprised because it turns out you and I have had conversations before. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I I expect that what you're saying is true, um, but it would be nice if somebody really rigorously tested that idea, because I, I think that that data, those data do not exist in a believable, comprehensive format. Is there a paper coming out in immunity at some point in the indefinite future (laughs) Uh, that's going to be testing this? (laughs) It's a a little different. I tried to stay really far away from this idea of pre-existing immunity um, just because it's... Mm, that's a fair. lot of it is bogged down in these papers from the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think, you know, mm. there's a slightly more interesting take if you just look at simultaneous responses. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely something that should be looked at in a very straightforward way. And I think that there are a very straightforward set of experiments that one could do in order to test it. So anyway, for the love of God, someone <laughs> make Matt a PI. <laughs> someone make Matt a PI. Give him a lab. Kevin, I'm Let pretty sure I could shit. do this experiment experiment in humans like i don't even think i would need mice for this stuff i don't know if i can get an irb on board but most of this stuff could be done in people (laughs) anyway yeah okay well that was a fun tangent yeah are we past figure one yet i don't think we're past figure one yet no No. we're not we're not even into it but that's okay um we'll get into it so basically another point i wanted to make about these by the way uh just for the listeners is that these are formalin inactivated vaccines so these are dead these are non-infectious viruses that they're using to vaccinate the mice just to be clear uh so anyway so they they make these cocktails They inoculate the mice and they also test with and without alum, because as I said earlier, when they were trying to make rhinovirus vaccines back in the 70s, they were doing this without alum as an adjuvant or any adjuvants for that matter. Uh, What they see right off the bat is when they add alum to a one valent uh, cocktail, for example, one valent vaccine preparation, they boost the neutralizing antibody response from two to the third to two to the seventh. So they get a big boost just by. Yes, exactly. Just by adjuvanting. Um, And then basically what this figure shows beyond that is that they can increase the valency up to 10 valent and they don't have an impact on the titer, the output titer of the neutralizing antibodies in this assay. They basically get something around two to the seventh right across the board for the most part for each of the viruses that they test against. So that's a good sign. It means that when you increase valency, you're not taking a hit on how immunogenic your vaccine preparation is, at least in this system, in these mice which I think is great. And I thought this was a well-controlled experiment. So each for each group they tested against, I think it was something like 20 mice per group, and they did this in triplicate. So it's a lot of data in here, which is pretty good. Yeah, it looks good. So. I'd, like, I'd like one more data point out other than 18 days. I feel like you're hitting, yeah. you're sort of hitting the peak of your responses. And in my experience with these things, if something is going to drop off, mm-hmm. you're before it starts to drop off. Um, but anyway, these, they look, the data look good. They look okay. good. Yeah, I buy it. Good. All right. So then moving on to figure two, uh, in this case, they're playing off of 
an old vaccine strain that was tested in the 70s. So in 1975, somebody made a 10-valent inactivated vaccine, uh, and they had a really poor response to it, something like only 30 to 40 percent of the subjects that they tested wound up with neutralizing antibodies. But the input titers on this vaccine uh, were really, really low. The viral titers were really, really low uh, even before inactivation of the vaccine. So it was between 10 to the 1.5 to 10 to the 5.5 TCID 50 per mil. That's that's pretty low. And then they had to dilute it tenfold uh, in order to actually get it into a vaccine dose, which is about one mil. So, you know, with a vaccine dose, a typical vaccine dose, you're anywhere between half a mil to one mil and anything above that is really not so doable. Uh, so by Can you the, just say what's what's TCID 50? Yeah, I, that's actually that's, one I no, haven't that's heard that's a before. great that's a great question. So TCID 50 is one of the ways that we can quantify viruses. Um so in this case, uh, TCID50 in cell culture means uh, the amount of virus needed in which you induce cytopathic effects in 50% of the cells. In, in humans or animal models, um, this takes on a more sinister note. It's the amount of virus needed to kill 50% of your infected hosts. <laughs> but that's that's the LD50, right? Yes. Uh, that's another. Ter- yes, LD50. So, this so, is, so as TC well. here is tissue culture? In this case, is we're talking the... about tissue culture, yes, and not killing okay, animals. <laughs> Because <laughs> we're just talking about the response in this neutralization assay. Um, yeah, and, and so that's basically just a way for them to quantify virus. Uh, so when we're talking about numbers as low as uh, 10 to the 1.5 to 10 to the 5.5, and then talking about diluting that tenfold in order to get it into a, a viable vaccine dose, you've got, you know, very, very little starting virus, input virus, to try and get a response. Uh, so they basically this virus vaccine in 1975 got really poor response in their subjects. So what they did in this paper was they hypothesized that it really comes down to that input titer not being right and that if they boosted that, they might see a different uh, response. So they reconstituted that particular 10 valent vaccine as best as they could, they said, Um and they compared it, they they made one that had that low titer again, just like it did in the 70s. And then they also made one where they increased the titer, the, the initial inputs to greater than 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 7th. So higher, 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 more viable titers. And then they also uh, did uh, a prime boost in this case. So in 1975, they weren't doing a boost. They were just doing the prime uh, and then looking to see a response. They didn't get one. In this case, they did a prime boost. So what you're looking at here, uh, if you're following along in the paper, we have the magenta circles. Those are the low titer 1975 vaccine. And then we have the blue squares, and that's the new high input titer vaccine. And so what you can see is uh, when they measure the neutralizing antibody response 18 days after just the prime uh, inoculation, they only see about uh, half of the high titer vaccine uh, generating any neutralizing antibody response above their limit of detection, which they're setting at uh, two to the two, by the way. But you do see some of these high titer uh, vaccines you know, generating a neutralizing an- antibody response. And just like in 1975, none of that 1975 low titer vaccine is generate, generating any neutralizing antibody response. Uh, but then they do a boost in this case and then measure again. And in this case, after the boost, all of the high titer uh, new vaccines are generating now neutralizing antibody response. Uh, and about half of that low titer vaccine is now above the limit of detection for, for generating uh, neutralizing antibody response. Um, so this is definitely uh, an improvement on that vaccine. And they also happen to see that there's sort of a threshold, it looks like, for about a 10 to the 4 TCID50 input dose for induction of neutralizing antibodies. So it's dose dependent up until about 10 to the 4 as an input. And then above that, it doesn't seem to really affect the amount of neutralizing antibody response that you get. So titer clearly plays a role. I would argue uh, that the boost plays a, a, an even bigger role, in my opinion. But Matt, are we are we surprised at all by that finding that increasing increasing the titer tenfold doesn't seem to have a measurable impact, like above a certain threshold? Is because I know some immune responses are really like light switches. It's like they're on or they're off, um, and others have a much more sort of uh, graduated effect. And so I actually don't know the answer for for B cell responses. But does this surprise you? You can increase ten or a hundred fold and not seem to have a measurable change in uh, antibody responses? No, it doesn't surprise me. Um, it depends on where you're starting. So I can tell you that there's a really nice 
titratable dynamic range that exists somewhere on the B cell response. So if you're sort of in the measurable antibody titer range, you know, increasing or decreasing uh, your antigen tenfold is going to have a huge effect on your eventual B cell response. And but the bottom of that, right, it all exists on an S curve. So if you are well under your response threshold and you increase tenfold, um, then no, you you might not get anything measurable. I think I've done subunit vaccinations starting at like, God, the single nanogram ranges oh, wow. of, of protein. And that's where you start to reliably get uh, some sort of uh, B cell response in black six mice uh, with alum as an adjuvant, for example. So low nanograms to high picograms. Um, but if you're underneath that, like presumably you're getting some sort of activity down in the picogram range, but it doesn't really matter where you are. You know, you can increase or decrease a hundredfold and it doesn't make a difference. But if you start to get up into the high nanogram range, all of a sudden your tenfold differences are having a huge effect on titer. So it mm. may well be that that this, you know, 1970s dose was just so far under the thresholds that really, you know, uh, increasing tenfold, you, it, it probably does have a huge effect. You're just not going to see it systemically. I, I am not, <laughs> I'm similarly not surprised by the boost data um, because yeah, it turns out that boosting is a big deal. Wildly important. Uh, <laughs> funny, it, I have a funny story about that. If you guys want to hear it. <laughs> sure. Of course. Always up for funny stories. So. I can't remember the exact timeline on this. I know I was working at the Dana-Farber at the time, uh, and I was either pregnant with my daughter or I was nursing my daughter. But at some point during my time there, it was discovered that I have no titers to the chicken pox, turns mm. out. Uh, and I never had the chicken pox as a kid. My mother made me play with children with chicken pox. I just never got it. Uh, but when I was about 15, that's when they first came out with the chickenpox vaccine. So my pediatrician gave me the vaccine. And at the time, it was indicated for a single shot. It was one prime shot and you were supposed to be good. Well, it turns out that's not the case. <laughs> so well, it, it probably is for most people. It just sounds like you're not good at responding against be. the chicken pox. I, maybe I'm not. <laughs> I think, I think I the think chicken pox couple, is not though. good. At, the chicken pox is not good at getting into your system either, because if you were playing around kids with chicken pox and never got it, like maybe there was some original antigenic sin in your past where you already have a like wildly successful immune response. It just doesn't so like show up. Here's, in the titers here's where the story gets weird. And I've never told it to an immunologist. Maybe you have some insight. My mother loves to tell the story about how the day I was born, my sister came to see me and meet me in the hospital uh, and promptly broke out with her case of the chicken pox, just head to toe, a disaster. And I was quarantined and it was a big deal because I was exposed to my sister who had just now developed the chicken pox after handling me. And so my mother always said, oh, I bet it has something to do with that. And I have no idea. It sounds like magic to me, but maybe there is something to it. <laughs> no, inf infant immunology is all magic. It is. It yeah. really is. So yeah. maybe so I maybe I have neonatal superpower or something against the chicken pox. I think that Chadine is actually a chicken pox virus in human form. That that would be really bizarre. I have not had enough beers to <laughs> contemplate that, Kevin. <laughs> and I'm fresh out. But uh, yeah, so funny little side note, I have to get vaccinated. It was a big deal at the Farber because obviously, you know, being around a whole bunch of immunocompromised patients and not that I was being in a lab, uh, but not having titers to the chicken pox is, is quite a problem. There was quite the alert, but I was nursing and so could not have it at the time. So I still have to get that done. I haven't done that yet. I am interested in your after titers. I would yeah, like I, to, I am now interested I would like to well. see your labs. Yep. <laughs> All right. It's interesting. I will I will keep you guys updated. Perfect. Uh, but moving right along. So um, for Patreon subscribers only, Chadine's antibody titers. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. That's real weird. That is really weird. <laughs> I don't know who would want that, but yeah, there are there are weirdos out there. Maybe they would. Um, anyway, yeah, off this topic now, off this weird topic, moving right along. Uh, so in figure three, um, the idea here now is that they just want to up the ante, right? So they've tested out this 10 valent vaccine and they've seen a good response. Now they want to see if they can cram in 25 different strains of virus into the vaccine and make a 25 valent vaccine. So essentially this figure follows along very similar to the last. It's in a prime boost format again, uh, and they, they retest their 10 valent, uh, vaccine or maybe this is a different 10 valent vaccine. I can't keep straight all of the 
various strains floating around in this paper. Uh, and then they make this 25 valent vaccine. And again, you know, they're, they're seeing the same, the same sort of results that, um, you know, with a prime, a lot of these induce a reasonable response, but with a boost, almost all of them, nearly all of them, uh, induce a, a very good, uh, neutralizing antibody response in this case. So I think they thought with the 25 valent vaccine, uh, they had a 72% response rate after the prime and it bumped up to 96%. So 24 of the 25 virus types, uh, were inducing a neutralizing antibody response after boost. Can I can I interject here? So sure. again, having not having not read this paper in depth, I don't know the answer to this. Maybe it's obvious, but so looking at the strains that they had mm -hmm. low responses to, yeah. um, I don't see if any of those strains were in previous polyvalent things that they tested, right? So one hypothesis for the ones that are sort of on the low end of that range, some of them, some of the strains have undetectable Right, like 1B, responses. right? Is that who yeah. you're referring to? Yeah, 1B, yeah, he comes I mean, up again. Even, even 28 and 49 are not great. Yep. Um, but none of those are in the previous 10 valent or uh, I'm not sure if they're in the the lower valent vaccines. And so one hypothesis would be that they're just bad at making Neutral antibody, antibody responses against those serotypes. But another possibility is that those ones are getting competed out by the other ones. And so if you did like a five valent with just the lowest five on that graph, would you have much stronger responses or mm. would those be would those also be bad responses yeah, just because those question. serotypes are bad? That's a really good question. Yeah, I don't I don't know if they address that. Uh, I didn't dig into the supplement too much, although it was not a long supplement. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I do know that. So in the next figure, we'll get to um, they they. So one B, for example, is in their 50 valent and it same thing just craps out. No good neutralizing antibody response. So I think I, I sort of tend to lean towards that. Some of these maybe are just no good at making a good neutralizing antibody response, um, but it could be competition. It could Does be. that make sense? What do you mean? I mean, so you've got, I guess, what about this formalin inactivated virus is going to be significantly different from all of your other serotypes that you're not going to be able to make any kind of neutralizing antibody response against it? Is it just impossible to vaccinate against these serotypes? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I, I guess, yeah, there's... It's hard for me to pick out something that would be functionally different. Now, it could just be that you're trying to grow up, you know, 50, 100 viruses, right? And this this prep just wasn't that good. Or for some reason, the virus isn't as stable through the formulation process or all of those things. So I'd be more inclined to believe that it's probably just that the virus is failing to represent itself in the vaccine in the same way that all of the other ones are. But yeah. you could imagine in in particularly in the mouse models, although it seems to hold up in the in the macaques as well, that in an inbred mouse strain, it could just be that the for whatever reason, one B yep. doesn't bind to that mouse's MHC anywhere. It just happens to not have any good peptides that are well presented or something, which, you know, which would be um, interesting in and of itself, because it means that in addition to B cell diversity between these serotypes, there's also a T cell repertoire diversity. Right. And that's actually something mm. that's that could be critical in determining, you know, how these different responses interact with each other. Right. Yeah. Although I think that the fact that the this also happens in the macaques, which are which are not as genetically um, homogenous and also are clearly different than the mice. Yeah, yeah, um, you're right. One B also sucks there. So I think that yeah. a bad prep or something weird about that virus for whatever reason is probably more parsimonious. That seems I do reasonable. wonder actually about the bad prep thing, because they do mention in this paper, I just remember seeing it right here. So they said that um, when we're talking about figure three here, for some of these virus stocks, they actually used they swapped in a new set of stocks between the prime and the boost for the 25 valent vaccine. Mm. The reason being that in the interim, they obtained higher titer virus stocks for some of these. And one of those is 1B. However, mm. that doesn't hold true for like 28 that you pointed out, for example. Do you uh, think that 49. they freaked out after they vaccinated with 1B and they're like, oh, my God, we didn't get any titers. Go I check the prep. Right. And then some tech was like, oh, my God, there's no we virus in this prep. Stock. Let's make a better one. And yeah. then they put it in and they're like, well, we still don't have anything. <laughs> tech, you're fired. I'm sorry. I was supposed to keep that in the minus 80. I put it in the microwave. Well, I didn't realize. Yep. Yeah, it's it's perfectly possible who knows i was i remember being taken aback by that statement though they were very honest <laughs> yeah, well 
better that way, I think, than the other way. I think so too. Yes, I agree. Okay, all good points there. So yeah, so that's basically the crux of it, that they can, you know, they can increase the valency to 25 valent and they're still not seeing, you know, any sort of huge hit on immunogenicity. So comparing that to the 10 valent, you know, they were seeing a rough uh, neutralizing antibody titer of 2 to the 7th for the 10 valent and it's like something like 2 to the 6.8 for the 25 valent. So they're still getting a good response, they're claiming, from this result. Yeah, looks good. So then moving on to figure four, uh, now this is where they're going to, you know, sort of bump up the impact here by moving into the uh, macaques, the rhesus macaques. So, and there's only four of them, just FYI, but my understanding is housing and using macaques in experiments is extraordinarily expensive. Is this true? It sure is. Oh, yeah. Something yeah. like 30 oh, yeah. grand per animal or so. I, I, I thought I heard a quote like that once and my eyes bugged out of my head. <laughs> it's, yeah, well, it's, it's there's not a couple of things. I mean, one, they're, they're bigger than mice, obviously. No but a kidding. bigger part of it <laughs> is that, um, that you have to, you can't just like sack the monkeys when you're done with them. Nope. Um, you have to like if, if it's a non-terminal procedure, um, you still have to care for that macaque for the rest of its life. Well, and that's um, yeah. And that's built oh, wow. in. So basically the way that and I actually can speak to this research station because I worked there for several years. Um, basically, you have a field station, which is sort of like a big open enclosure, like I think a zoo enclosure, but with, you know, hundreds of macaques there. And so as each macaque, they have a breeding program as well. As each macaque is born, you you tag them and you can sort of track them. And actually, it turns out macaques are sort of like prison gangs. They're really angry creatures and they form these cliques. Oh, and wow. you have to be really careful when you take a macaque out of the enclosure uh, for experimental purposes. When you put them back, you have to make sure that you match it back to their group because they will they will just kill each other. They oh, will wow. tear each other apart if you put them back in the wrong group. So anyway, they're Terrifying. highly territorial and they sort of operate like prison gangs. But um, <laughs> so when you basically pull, so a researcher will sort of submit a request for a vaccination thing like that. You would have some, you know, primary or prime. Yeah, you'd have some requirements for what kinds of animals you're looking for. And the vet staff will basically search through their databases and find you animals that meet your requirements. And at the end of that procedure, basically what happens is you just uh, return the macaques back to that environment. So um, it's not like you you buy a macaque and then you have to you know care for it for the rest of their lives. Basically, what's happening is you've got an active breeding program and you're pulling animals in and replacing them as the research is uh, needed. Gotcha. But th- they'll often they'll often be the same macaque will be used in multiple different experiments. Exactly. Is that right? Yeah. So if you've got a um, if you've got a vaccine study like this, which is relatively simple, right? You give the vaccination and then you draw serology. It doesn't necessarily make a difference that that macaque was looked at for. A behavioral study, you know, six months earlier, right? Because you're looking for a completely independent thing. So they'll try to uh, match animals to researchers based on the needs of the researchers and sort of the uh, history of the macaque. Right. Interesting. Okay. So in this but case, they're, yeah, they're damn expensive. They're really the expensive. Yeah. <laughs> they're really expensive. It's hard to work with them. Um, it's dangerous politically to work with them. So it, it is a big deal to do these experiments. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Well, so in this case, they had four of them, uh, and it's the same format as the last time. So they're doing a prime boost, uh, and they're comparing their 25 valent vaccine now to a 50 valent. So they've increased the valency to 50. Uh, and they've got a uh, prime and then they do serology on day 18 and then a boost and they pull again on day 46. And what they showed here was, again, a really good neutralizing antibody response uh, for the most part. So in the case of uh, the macaques that were uh, immunized with the 25 valent vaccine, I think they saw something like a 96 percent response in, in one uh, animal, 100 percent response in another just after the prime. And after the boost, it was 100 percent in both cases. Uh, with the 50 valent vaccine, uh, the number goes down a little bit, but it's something like 90 percent and 82 percent in the two animals after prime and then like 98 percent after boost. And the titers are really high. So they saw uh, neutralizing antibody titers of two to the nine point three uh, for the 25 valent vaccine and two to the eight point six for the 50 valent vaccine. 
Um, I was impressed. It's an impressive response, although they do have a supplement in there which points out that this is a type specific response. It's not a cross protective response. So they did end up testing these, uh, the 25 valent anyway, against 10 non vaccine strain viruses, and they got no cross neutralization. Which is yeah, that, important. That to point in and of out. itself is interesting. I think, um, it, particularly for the the reason that Matt alluded to earlier, which is that like you could imagine some antigen competition happening here. You could imagine in some germinal centers you have B cells competing for T cell help. Um, and one way around that might be like, oh, you just found the B cells that happen to like hit everyone. And so they're getting they're getting help from a bunch of T cells from all these different strains. But it sounds like uh, actually these are a bunch of different B cells. All of them are specific for one strain. And yet they are all getting activated mm -hmm. can, somehow. Can we identify whether how cross reactive each one of these individual responses is? Is that is that discernible from from these data? Like, for example, if I vaccinate with different strains of flu yep. and then I coat a plate with different strains of flu on each individual ELISA, mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that a significant part of my response to each individual strain is actually cross-reactive against other right. serotypes. So if I'm looking at, for example, figure 3B, mm -hmm. where let's say strains two all the way up to about 16 mm -hmm. look to have almost identical tighter responses. Yep. Sure. How much of those responses can I be confident are actually serotype specific versus if I took all of those strains, what I'm really doing is I'm hitting B cells that react in a cross reactive way against multiple strains. And so what it looks like is that I'm responding to each one individually, but really I'm selecting for a few clones that actually have very broad specificity across these serotypes. Yeah, I guess one one thing that would be informative, not perfect for reasons that we talked about earlier, but would be to see a phylogenetic tree with these strains. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like how related yeah, are the strains that seem to have uh, equivalent responses? Or even if I just took serotype 33 and vaccinated with that purely mm -hmm. and then ran exactly this same ELISA set. Right. And looked to see what the antibody responses across all of them looked like. Are you paying for that, Macaque? Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm just saying it's an interesting experiment to be Definitely. done. But I think that's what they're, but isn't that what they're saying? Isn't, I thought that's what they were saying in this supplement that they, that's basically what they did. They tested it against 10 other viruses that were not in the initial vaccine prep and they saw no response basically. Right. But that's they've why got, they're positing that this isn't cross protective. Sure. I mean, so what but you're suggesting got, is that the, the strains that are in the prep are by chance cross protective and the 10 others that they tested against, for example, just weren't and it happened that they chose them that way. I'm or suggesting that by including 50 viruses in your vaccine, uh -huh. it's possible that you're selecting for B cells that are cross reactive. Whereas sure. if you vaccinate with one, you'll be selecting for B cells that are serotype specific. So okay, if I see your they, point. yeah, so I think that by the nature of putting together a cocktail and vaccinating the way that they're doing, I think that they're actually selecting for cross-reactive B cells, which is something that is not all that well supported by the literature, but I actually happen to think that it's true. And I think that that's going to come out in a stronger way over the coming years. Mm. Not necessarily a bad thing when we're talking no, vaccines great, for this, right? No, it's great, actually. <laughs> uh, and it's been shown sort of accidentally in Ebola, believe it or not, where they uh, put a cocktail together um, just because they wanted to try to get uh, antibody titers against a number of different strains of Ebola. And it turns out that when they put the cocktail together, they just accidentally got a whole bunch of broadly neutralizing cross-reactive antibodies. Oh. <laughs> well, that was lucky. Which is great. <laughs> no, I, and I think, so I think that there's a lot of promise to an approach like this, but I, I don't think that um, a single vaccination and then looking for cross reactivity is definitely is necessarily going to overcome the potential challenges. Gotcha. Well, that is basically all for the main body figures of this paper. Um, a final thing that they did, which I thought was an interesting 
thing to sort of toss in at the end, and this wound up in the supplement, is a sort of a proof of principle that they could make these lab-generated vaccine strains uh, something potentially viable in humans is they remade the virus vaccine preps in a more uh, appropriate cell line. So they use this cell line WI38, which is a human lung fibroblast from a three months gestation fetus. And it's a it's considered a, a vaccine production line. And they made it and they uh, did some HPLC and they said, you know, proof of principle, it still works. We can do this on a, on a sort of um, above board level. And then interestingly enough, as I said, um, I realized that it seems like Epimery has optioned this technology now to a startup, which Martin has founded, Martin Moore has founded called um, Misa Vaccines Inc. or Misa Vaccines Inc., uh, and they are actually working on an 83 valent vaccine at the moment. They have a, an NIH SBIR grant to do that. Do it. Um, which do I think it. is really cool. And like I said, yeah. you know, his whole philosophy, he really believes that you can boil the entire issue down to a matter of manufacturing, which is pretty sweet. So, yeah, I mean, well, I feel like the immunology might be relevant. Well, too. no, <laughs> it is. But there's there's definitely an argument to be made that there are a lot of problems in the immunology of vaccination that can be overcome by just adding an enormous amount of antigen. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's fair. That's pretty clear from my experiments as well. That's pretty, I mean, like I said, I would volunteer for this study and that's what he's hoping. You know, he's obviously you can't do challenges. There's no good animal models for this. So, you know, your challenges are human challenges. Can, can you not do challenges in humans? Not, in humans. Yeah. Not, not in animals, but you can in humans. And specifically because this is, you know, it's not that deadly pathogenic really, you know? So they, they think will, people would be willing to sign up. I certainly would be uh, willing be to sign up for that. Yep. I'd be down. down. Although I do have my concerns, you know, they don't really address much in this paper about how long the protection would last. I think there was one point made that they saw, maybe it was off of figure three, where one of the, maybe the 25 valent vaccine, they saw persistence up to 203 days. Um, so no, no real comment on whether or not this would be a yearly vaccine or, you know, what the deal would be. And again, I think, you know, you're, you're not missing an insignificant, you're missing an, a very large chunk of virus by not being able to produce something against these newly discovered rhinovirus C, uh, species. That's something like 55 strains worth. So that's definitely a concern going forward, I think. Although, I mean, if it's truly just a manufacturing problem, then it's not all that insurmountable. No, but they, I did do a little research into into uh, HRVC just because I was curious, because that's now we're getting into my territory, what I'm interested in. Um, and it seems like this virus is just a real pain to try and grow. It doesn't grow in traditional cell culture. And there are some thoughts that actually it might not even use the same receptor for binding the cells Ooh. because there are such structural disparities in the VP1 uh, capsid protein um, right, with, right within the sites for receptor binding. So that's kind of an interesting point. And that is not a challenge that is necessarily easily overcome, I think. Sure. Uh, well, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to get uh, three quarters less colds. Yes. <laughs> As a parent whose children go to daycare. Yes. <laughs> that actually brings up a question that I had about this, which is that I wonder if you if you actually were successful in generating this vaccine, to what extent are viral infections uh, susceptible to like niche adaptation, right? So, so imagine that, you know, there is a niche, which is respiratory infections of humans, and there's only so much of it that can be filled. And rhinovirus A currently occupies a huge amount of that. If we vaccinate and everybody becomes immune to rhinovirus A, would rhinovirus C like fill in that gap and we would end up, I, I don't know if viral infections have that same, you know, like in, in a in an environment, if you're imagining like a, a bacterial niche or something like that, if you wipe out one strain of bacteria, right. another one is probably going to fill in that niche. But, but I don't know. But if, there's constant exposure in that, right? So you're making the assumption right now that the existence of rhinovirus A is somehow keeping rhinovirus virus C at bay, right? You don't think that's the case? No. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I think that if you get both rhinovirus A and C hitting you at the same time, you're just going to get sick twice. Yeah. That seems to be what the data is suggesting, too. I mean, it's, this is still pretty new. They haven't done a whole lot of looking for co-infection, for example, but they are seeing them together. Hmm. I. It seems... It doesn't seem super plausible to me that if you have an already inflamed airway, that rhinovirus C is going to have an equal chance of 
establishing infection in that airway as if it was a right. non-inflamed airway. But the airway. same is true in the other direction, and you're right. ignoring co-infection. <laughs> I'm not ignoring it. I'm just saying that, that it's not. <laughs> you are. It's not clear to me. No, no, not at all. I, there's a probability level here, right? There's there's some in order for a virus to go global, infect a huge number of people in a given season. There is some threshold of contact and infection rate that affect whether it becomes super prevalent or not. Right. And if you lower the probability because at the time that one virus is likely to be infecting hosts, most of those hosts have active infections that they are fighting off. And so they have neutrophils flooding the area. They have a bunch of uh, type one interferon floating around. You're going to decrease the probability that that virus is able to establish an infection. And if that's the case, then it's going to have less ability to spread yeah. throughout a population. Uh, look, I, Not saying I mean, that it never happens. I, yeah, but I, I, I could see what you're saying being sort of theoretically correct. I just... I'm not convinced that the predator prey relationships look the way that they would need to look in order for that to be a significant hindrance of the C species. But well, I think that it would be interesting to test. It sure would. <laughs> and maybe someone I is testing it. I think epidemiology is cool. Epidemiology <laughs> is cool. It's crazy. It is yeah. crazy. <laughs> And maybe with that, this has been Audio Immunity. <laughs> <laughs> Epidemiology is crazy. Yeah. Mic drop. Yes. Um, so we're doing pretty good, guys. Three episodes every other week. Uh, I've been getting them posted within a week, which is impressive for us. I think we can keep it going. I should mention, we forgot to mention up at the top, but um, Kate is now a doctor. Yay, um, Kate. Woo! Go, Kate. So... That's exciting. And I, I invited her to come on, even though she just defended yesterday. <laughs> I'm not surprised she didn't show up. Um, but uh, we should all give her congratulations. Hopefully she will be joining us again in the near future. If you want to get in touch with us, you should go to immunity.org and find us there. There's contact links. There's a form that you can fill out to tell us what topics we should cover, what papers we should cover. You can tell Matt that he's wrong about epidemiology. Um, <laughs> That's certainly the other true. Thing, the other thing that you, we would love for you to do is go to patreon.com slash audioimmunity where you can donate and help us make these episodes possible. We've got like, I think we're up to six donors now, five or six donors. That's awesome. Um, we're making more than $10 an episode, which doesn't seem like a lot. We but, are rolling uh, I just got it. the bill for uh, <laughs> the year of web hosting. Um, and so uh, it it actually does make a, a big difference to us. So um, again, that's patreon.com slash audio immunity. And you can give us 50 cents an episode or a dollar an episode. Um, and it it really helps motivate us. And um, it's just really great to to see uh, the support uh, from our fans. Very nice. And do you mind if I plug my blog, Kevin? Not at all. You sh definitely should. So I'm trying this new thing with my blog uh, where I try and write a lay summary of our episodes that we talk about here for people who maybe don't have a science background or want to sort of read about things on their own time. Uh, and I did for last week's episode, I did a, a lay summary and I'm also including some of my hand-drawn science artwork uh, as well in that. So if you want to check that out. Which are really great. And oh, thank Matt, you. I think that you 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 have some competition here great uh, <laughs> good. for the for the immunology based comics so nice. uh, they're, they're not that good trust me <laughs> uh, mine are not I that disagree. great but it's fun it's a nice outlet my kids draw a lot so i'm sort of rediscovering my childlike love of drawing which is is fun uh, i have this dream of writing a children's book next year maybe you guys can help me with that do it definitely uh, but anyway my blog is at uh, www.thesciemindedidealist.blogspot.com uh, so you can feel free to check that out as well and we'll post a link to that as well nice. um we'll we'll make sure that there's all kinds of link love uh on immunity.org um you can also find us on facebook uh, facebook.com slash audio immunity we didn't get any questions this week i didn't solicit questions uh but you should feel free to ask at any time we're also going to be uh, trying to get a way so that you know what papers are coming up. And so if you want to read it ahead of time and, and post questions for us, that would be awesome. More on that in the future. I'm on Twitter. Chadine's on Twitter. What else? Am I missing anything? Camilla we is on really Twitter as well. We should really write this stuff down. Camilla's on Twitter as well. Um, she's in Sweden. That's why she didn't join us this evening, which is fair. It's always dark there at this time of year. I think that's it. Oh, the music at the beginning and the end of the show is composed by Rachel Reinick, who, if you are in the Boston area, has a show on Friday night at the Dedham Square Coffee House. Um, 
which by the time this episode is posted, it'll already be over. So I don't know why I'm saying it, but it's going to happen and it's going to be great. So, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.